What's up, everybody? Brett Mix here, Mixer Madness. And thank you for deciding to spend your next oh, 20 or so minutes here with no advertisements because it's a fairly new channel. Uh, just for some quick updates of what happened with some brief analysis. Just a quick rundown of the show. That's how I do my reviews to the point what happened with a little bit of thoughts here and there. So let's run it down. What happened? Uh, settle in for the SmackDown review. Don't forget to hit like if you enjoyed this and definitely make sure you subscribed. I really, really appreciate that. Whether you watched the show or you wanted another opinion, or whether you didn't watch the show and you want a quick rundown of how it was, either way, I thank you for being here. Times are exciting as the Royal Rumble is just eight days away. So here we go with SmackDown from Atlanta, Georgia, January the 19th, 2024. It's probably my favorite WWE night of the year. Mania comes close, night one and two. Those would be my second and third highest. Rumble is usually my favorite show every year. We knew tonight that going in, we'd see Logan Paul on the KO show, a women's tag match, and the contract signing with the four in the main event. That's what we knew we would get. And then they started off the show with a podium. They got the carpet laid out. They got the four mics on the table, so we know it's there. So we start from Atlanta, Georgia, with the Tribal Chief walking in on Paul Heyman, and, and with his sweatshirt says, Atlanta, acknowledge me. I thought that was a nice little touch. We start the show with Nick Aldis saying, Welcome to a live SmackDown from, welcome to a sold out live SmackDown from Atlanta, Georgia, and welcome to officially the official Fatal Four Way contract signing. Good thing they're putting this first. That way then a match can be made for the night and we're not just subjected to some harsh words for the main event. We'll see what they do. First comes Styles, then comes Knight, then comes Orton. And every, all the faces have made their way to the ring. Uh, but the, uh, Roman Reigns has yet to do so. But Paul Heyman comes out to Roman Reigns' theme. Uh, eventually got him. And nice little touch there. Uh it was good to see Randy Orton uh, come out and uh, he what he did when he came out was there was a fan that was in the middle uh, the front, the front row and he went like this to get his hand clapped by Orton and Orton stopped a second time just to make sure he got his fan. The fan didn't see him stop though so he waited an extra few moments just to make sure that that fan patted his hand. I th think little things like that go a long way and uh it was just a vet, nice veteran move for Randy Orton to do that for the fan. Uh, Nick Aldis, uh, Paul Heyman says to Nick Aldis, he says that my client isn't here because he's not going to, he just got in the building. He's not going to sign a contract because he should be wrestling in a singles match. So Nick Aldis says, that's perfectly fine. If Roman wants, won't sign, we'll have a three-way for the vacant title. If the fans, ooh and ah, as Heyman goes from being perfectly fine to okay now we have business to talk to and Heyman storms back to the ring the fans chant for Orton at this time which is a little odd a little weird spot for them to chant Orton uh, Heyman says to all this I care deeply for you sir I do I halfway respect the mediocre job you've done there's no way you can sell this to the fans or to the tribal chief he said Roman should be defending it in a singles match. Knight says, will you just shut the hell up? Knight then interjects on how it should be him versus Reigns because he was the one that should be getting him in a singles match. That's how it was originally laid out. So now we're getting a segment with these three and Heyman to preserve Reigns for later in the show. AJ Styles says, you don't get it tonight. And Knight and him have some good back and forth. Uh, they w weren't on the same page originally when Styles came back a few weeks ago when he attacked Knight, and Knight hasn't forgotten. In my preview, I said they might have words together, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out the situation. There was already tension with Styles and Knight, as I just pointed out. Heyman is laughing his ass off at all the commotion between the baby faces, the evil, the evil wise man, of course, laughing maniac maniacally. Or is that a word, maniacally? You know what I mean. Orton then says to Heyman, he sees what he's trying to do, and it won't work. Because after he drops Solo, he will teach Roman the three most dangerous letters in sports entertainment. And I thought he was going to say WWE, judging by the ratings. No, I'm just kidding. He says RKO, and yeah, I just laughed at my own joke. Uh, the segment ends simple enough. This was a simple and effective way to get a segment to get in some turmoil between the faces. We know there's turmoil against the heel, but we want the faces to get a little bit of bad blood in there so we know it's not just going to be a three-on-one match at the Rumble. 
we so a decent opening segment. It got its point across. It it it, it said that we're gonna get a couple of matches for tonight, and uh, it kept you on the edge of your seat about okay, we haven't seen Reigns yet, so we're gonna see Reigns in a big way probably later. So it did that. So that's what you always want from an opening segment. You want to not only entertain, you want to set the stage for the rest of the show with what the match is going to be, and you want to give up a question. The question here is, where is Reigns going to sign the contract? That's the question there. And the entertainment would be the dialogue against Heyman and with Knight and Styles. So they open the show up with a six-man tag, the LWO with Carlito, uh, with Zelina Vega taking on Santos Escobar, Angel Garza, and Humberto Carrillo. Carlito teaming up with the LAW hero, and they start with chops and uh, spectacular hurricane runners to one another as these guys rock the luchador uh, AAA style of wrestling. So high risk maneuvers, maneuvers are natural. Somersault plunges to the outside. We go to a commercial break two minutes in, on point, like every match. If you want to have a match, just come in four minutes. If you want to watch a match on TV, just come in four minutes after the opening bell. That way you miss the first little spot they do, and then you miss the two minutes of commercials that full follow. Seriously, if you want to watch a WWE match in 2024 on TV, that's what you do. You wait four minutes from the opening bell. Time it next time. Go, go to your microwave. Go to your cell phone. Pipe in four minutes from the opening bell. I swear I swear to God, this isn't a joke. Time four minutes and then when those four minutes are over, you miss the commercial and the opening little spot. And then the match begins. That's what you pretty much get for every match. I hate to vent on the same things, but we're one-fourth of the way through SmackDown as I wrote my notes. I wrote this, what I'm saying to you right now, I wrote this at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. That's one-fourth of the way through the show, and we've seen one minute of wrestling. And that's the one minute that we get to the outside. I don't like it. I like the booking needs to change. Back in the Attitude Era, we had matches... They would last five minutes or so, just like matches were tonight. Tonight had about three matches that were five minutes. So, and no, not one commercial interruption in those matches back in the Attitude Era, unless it was the main event and it was like 10 to 15 minutes long. But anyways, that's what worked back then. I have no idea why they don't do it now. I mean, you can say that you can say the excuse for Raw is that it's a three-hour show, so they have to break up the quarterly hour segments like that. But for a two-hour SmackDown, what's the excuse? I can't see one. Other than the fact that they're just lazy with their booking. Anyway, back to the match. After the break, Escobar dropkick Carlito and he tags out Humberto with a tag in to Angel Garza. They had a tag to Escobar so they could triple team. They elevated him with a double gorilla press and then he landed on the knee of Santos Escobar. Wild worked over in the corner. Escobar with a front face lock. Joaquin Wild with a legacy of the Lucha Libres at stake, he says, said Graves on commentary. And he also also talks about how Escobar's stock has risen since he left the LWO. Anyways, back to the match. Uh, Joaquin Wilde, out of nowhere, performed an amazing move, and Carlito got a hot tag, closing the clotheslining the opposition with forearm shots. Uh, Escobar broke up a pinning attempt by Carlito. Humberto with a shot near the end here. Escobar connects with a kick, and Wilde outside jumps in the fray and slams Escobar to the uh, down. And Carlito comes in. Escobar all of a sudden drags Carlito with the roll up of Doom and wins the match at a TV time of 8 19. Right in the match, two stars, and in, including the commercial, it went 8 19. So that's what I mean by a TV time. We only saw 8 19 of it. It actually lasted probably 10 to 11 minutes, but because of the commercial, it's 8 19. So, uh,. Big win for them, but it ends with a roll up. I hate I hate the roll up. It's just so simplistic. Anyway, pretty deadly are interviewed after this by Kyla Braxton, and as they said tonight they face Tyler Bate and Butch. They say they're not afraid. It's good to know. Pretty deadly take on Tyler Bate and Butch. Tyler Bate with an airplane spin as Elton goes flying out of the ring. Pete Dunn catches Elton Prince, and then Tyler Bate goes out flying out of the ring like a saucer. Pete Dunn El drops Elton Prince with the bitter. End and gets the victory. Uh, Dunn and Bate win. I rated the match two stars and a quarter. It was actually a decent tag match. Didn't do play by play for it, but it was decent in action. They do a video package of Kevin Owens and Logan Paul for the night. Uh, they do the KO show. They do everything that's led up to this. And the KO show is about to go. And uh, Kevin Owens, who gets better with age, has made a fan out of me. 
I wasn't always no one's fan, but I really dig him lately. I've always respected the guy. Uh, don't get me wrong. I just never connected with him as a fan. I do now. He's won me over. And that's been the story of Owen's career, right? He wins people over, over, and over. And uh, say that five times fast. Uh, so, yeah, he wins people over. And, uh, yeah, Kevin Owens, uh, I really dig his mic work as a face. As a heel, he gets a little bit too whiny. So I, I like this Kevin Owens. Graves does an amazing job at analyzing why these two guys are polar opposite, opposites, if you couldn't tell already. Why Owens has had to work for every inch, whereas Logan Paul, with his smarts, just stumbles into greatness easily. I thought that contrast was a nice description by uh, Corey Graves on commentary there. Paul says he's the reason he's in the WWE. He says KO, he's, he says he has to thank him. He's the reason he's in the WWE. He shows the clip of Owens stunning him at WrestleMania and the fans chant one more time. Owens says he's been wrestling for 25 years, which gets a good ovation, rightfully so. Has it been that long? So that means the dude's been wrestling since the late 90s? That can't be right. I mean, unless he wrestled as a teenager. Uh, I guess I'm not going to say he's wrong. I guess he has been wrestling that long. He must be older than I thought he was then. Owens talks about... Uh, because Paul was given all the tools to win the U.S. title, and he talks about that being a joke, and he's going to put an end to that joke at the Rumble. Paul talks about how much of an innovator he is, and he talks about he, he goes on to talk about how he's an entrepreneur, social media star, and how he, he, he's this and he's that, and everything KO can't be. KO says he's getting up from everything, and they talk about the cast. Owen says, you know what, I'm going to take this cast off right now so you can't use this as an excuse, pretty much. I'm paraphrasing that, but that's pretty much the gist. And uh, Logan Paul cheap shots him. He sucker punches Owens. And right before this, Owens says, you, there's not a shot you can give me that I won't come back from for, within three seconds. I've landed off the highest things in WWE. I've done this. I've done that for the last you know, 10 years in WWE. Uh, so you can't do anything to me, basically. And uh, so Logan Paul takes his word up on that, and he sucker punches him. But oh, and Logan Paul wasn't expecting Owens to get up, but Owens takes about five to ten seconds, and he gets up mad, and he yells, "Is that all you got?" And he spears Logan Paul, and he gives him right hands and left hands. They end up brawling to the outside, and Logan Paul smacks Kevin Owens' hand right into the ring post. Great segment. Uh, great promo on the KO show. So far, that's the highlight of the show. The Logan Paul uh, KO segment. Roman backstage. And Solo says last week was on him and he's going to fix the issue. While the fans on the fans in the background chanted ye because he mentioned Jimmy Uso for a brief moment did Roman Reigns. Carter and Chance defend the titles against Ilya Dawn and Elda Fire. Bailey does commentary for the match. She's great on commentary. She calls herself the Mommy Slayer. <laughs> Hopefully she does win the Rumble. Her, Bianca, and Lynch are the three favorites, clearly. They, they've they given those three the, the rub. Who wins it? I'm not sure. Probably not Bailey. I'm, I'm going to say Becky Lynch wins it. But uh, I'll do my whole Royal Rumble predictions next week, obviously. After SmackDown, after the Go Home Show, I'll do my Royal Rumble predictions. I went perfect on my Survivor Series predictions. Uh, but uh, we'll see what happens with the Royal Rumble. Well, Carter, uh, well, I'm just thinking now that I do the Royal Rumble predictions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick who gets thrown out last too, because that's what I did with the Survivor Series with the War Games. I picked who got pinned, and I was right uh, on the women's side. I was right on the men's side for who pinned, but I was the only thing I got wrong in the whole Survivor Series was who was pinned on the men's side. I said J.D. McDonough would get pinned, but it was Damian Priest. But anyways, back to the show. The tag title match here. Carter hit a destroyer. Now Chance is elevated in the ring, and then she uh, is elevated by Caden Carter and uh, Katiana Chance uh, gets elevated right on top of Alda Fire, and they pin him, and they get the win. And after the match, damage control come to the ring, and albeit the match only lasted a few minutes, it was still pretty decent. I rated it two stars. The Kabuki Warriors take the titles from Carter and Chance, and they start dancing with them. And it was pretty hilarious. You had to see it. It's 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 funnier when you watched it than it sounds. They rip the titles back from and but Asuka just keep Oscar just keeps dancing. Uh, they have a match next week for the titles, so that should be good. A uh, nice brief vignette for the final testament. Another one. They had one on Raw, I believe. 
or it was last SmackDown, like one or the other, or both. Uh, but another good one for the final testament. Carmelo Hayes is going to ball out, he says, in his promo after the accident last week with him and Austin Theory. Austin Theory then gets put in a match with Carmelo Hayes next week in Miami on SmackDown uh, by Grayson Waller, by his friend. And this was a good comedy segment, how he set up the match and said, you know, Austin Theory is ready to take you on any time. And Austin Theory looks at him like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? You're, you're making this hard on me. That was great stuff there. LA Knight takes on AJ Styles. Styles is playing a tweener character against the Mega Overface, who hasn't really been given much time lately with just to shine on the mic like he can. Tonight, he was given the ball for a couple minutes to run wild on the microphone like LA Knight can, and he does. Whenever he gets the opportunity, he makes the most of it, and he did that tonight earlier in the contract segment. But I'd say in the last few weeks, I don't know if they're sheltering him or they don't want him to be the top face. I'm not sure what they're doing, but... There he was for a while. There he was looking like he was catching stone cold type fire, and uh, now in the last few weeks they've kind of sheltered him. I don't know if I'm alone when I say that. Tell me in the comment section if you think so. I think that they've sheltered him a little bit. Both men get into a chopping war with each other. Styles uh, Styles actually hits his ring head in the ring post, and I, I think that was legit. That uh, looked pretty legit, and it looked like he got his. Luckily, he had stars going around him. He looked dazed. Um, but they continue the match, and they chop away at each other. LA Knight does his yeah shots with the head on the announce table on the outside. LA Knight's then thrown into the barricade by Styles. Uh, he does the yeah drops on Styles on the announce desk again. Now comes Jimmy Uso to a bunch of boos. LA Knight goes to the stage area to see what Jimmy Uso wanted. And when he comes back, Styles hits him with an insiguri by the announce table. Then when Styles is by the uh, a barricade, Solo Sokoa comes in four minutes into the match, and he disqualifies Styles and Knight at the same time. It's a double disqualification. He attacks Styles. Sokoa takes down him. Knight takes down. Knight is taken down. Styles is taken down by Sokoa and Uso. Sokoa grabs the mic and goes two down, one to go. Randy Orton, get out here now. So he calls him out for the main event, and now we got Solo Sokoa versus Randy Orton. We still haven't seen the Tribal Chief yet tonight, so you know he's going to show up near the end or at the end unless he's going to come down in the middle of the match. We'll have to wait and see. Orton and Solo Sokoa get it on. Orton's skull crushed in the corner by Solo Sokoa, and as Graves said, he could, he could be done. We have one last final commercial upcoming, so I'm expecting a big spot. And as, just as I say that, Solo Sokoa sends Orton into the steps. There's the commercial break. We come back and Mayhem has gone on as Styles and Knight fight by the stage. Uh, so as they came back out and uh, Solo Sokola was about to spike Orton and instead Orton was waiting there and spotted him with an RKO uh, and, and, and then he gets the pinfall. So I rated the match a star and a quarter. The show ends with the main f three faces in the ring talking about talking amongst one another until end and Knight drops Styles with an RKO. An RKO to Styles. Orton wants the big dog, but he comes in with a Superman punch and gets the heel heat as he smiles. Reigns just soaks in the heat from Atlanta and smiles while Aldis hands him the contract and he signs the paper but drops it for Nick Aldis rather than handing it to him. Reigns then in the corner gets ready for a spear or another punch and right as he's about to do it to Randy Orton to drop out everyone, Orton counters it in midair and gives him the RKO. So Orton has his final move to Reigns uh, that's not the final spot before the Royal Rumble, but it is for a week till the Royal Rumble. So it should be interesting to see who the last one standing is next week uh, when it is the go-home show. Uh, so overall, this episode of SmackDown was a 5.5 out of 10 because it had a decent opening segment with the contract signing, a six-man tag, and a couple other decent tag matches. I thought the Owens promo with Paul had more was more good stuff between the two. The Night Styles match went uh, wasn't much, but it continued the main event story, and the main event between Orton and Sokoa was just kind of billed to the finish line, pretty much with Reigns getting the last word, or so we thought, until the RKO. Nice spin they put on the broadcast there. Overall, the show was just a hint above mediocre. Just eight days before the second biggest show of the year, could they have done better? Of course. There's almost always room for improvement, but did they phone it in here? No. I can see that they tried to deliver here and what they had with what they had, but it just wasn't too compelling or captivating. 
And that's just how it was for this week. We'll see how the go-home shows fare this week when Raw's in New Orleans and SmackDown is in Miami before the Rumble's in Tampa. All three shows next week. I can't wait. And I'll have uh, and I'll have those reviews right here. So stay subscribed and notified. I'll be back with these reviews next week. Thanks so much for watching. Leave a like and make sure you return for SmackDown next week as well. For January 19th, 2024, SmackDown from Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Brett Mix, and I'm out.